thanks again to um, Hemp Engineering. Uh, we are uh, pleased to have today uh, the a new beginning of a series of um, interviews with pioneers all around the world. Uh, today we have Erin. Erin uh, is uh, right now working in Paraguay along CAR. They are both um, have a hell of a job ahead and a big heavy weight in their, in their shoulders because they were basically hired to kick off the industry in that country. Welcome Erin. Hi, how's it going? Oh, thanks very for having me. To, I'm very pleased to have you, and, and, and it's very uh, challenging the times ahead. Everything that is happening around the world, yes. Um, it's the labor that I know that you are doing right now is not just for Paraguay, but to decrease the poverty in that country and um, find a way to use these technologies that uh, can be useful to solve a lot of problems anywhere on the third world. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do have a series of questions. Um, uh, the first one is, of course, is your biops, uh, synopsis by, by itself. I uh, would like you to talk to uh, the audience uh, about yourself. But more important is how did you end up working for the hemp business? Okay. Oh, well, I'd love to. Um, so my name is Erin Lindley, and as uh, Ramon mentioned, I'm currently working in Paraguay, introducing the crop to that country. I've been working pretty much extensively only in hemp for the past three years, uh, but I got my start in the natural health industry. I opened up a little health food store when I was 20 years old. I walked in and I, to my mom's place. I said, Mom, I want to open up a health food store, and she said, write a business plan, and so I did. And I became an entrepreneur who had to figure out pretty much every aspect of the natural health industry. And about two years into that, a man named Charles Holmes, who is another pioneer in our industry, who is since um, we, we uh, was, has left us, walked into um, my store with a bag of hemp protein and started talking about the miracles of what hemp protein was as a food. It's one of the most bioavailable forms of protein on the planet. And it just got my hippie you know, senses going. I got very excited about this product. I remember going into the back and grabbing some of this stuff, which was generation one the hemp protein and putting it in some juice and mixing it around and tasting it down. And oh, it tasted like crap. You know, this was the, ver the first, uh, first generations of hemp protein. And since then, I've remained in the natural health industry, but I've always had hemp protein in my diet, whether it be in hemp hearts and uh, hemp protein. So fast forward, I actually had my own manufacturing company because I'm a chronic entrepreneur. And, um, and so I learned all of the different avenues of how to develop a product and how to bring it to market. It's not just an idea. It's a whole process that takes you through to the end goal. And um, I moved from that and I went into, uh, I was looking on uh, the Canadian Health Food Association website and I noticed Charles Holmes's name pop up again. And so I gave him a call and I asked him, I said, hey, I want a job. And he said, you're, well, you're a firecracker, sure. And I started working at Hempco. And there I ended up being their innovation lead, working on different recipes and different products. <clears throat> It was a fascinating time in the industry um, because it was really moving into this public legal space. Um, after that, um, it kind of come, becomes an adventure. I like to say that I travel around the world and I teach people about hemp. Anybody will listen to me um, or my colleague Carl Martel will find that, you know, within five seconds, we're touting the benefits of hemp, what we can do with hempcrete. And it's taken us to Australia, Ireland, um, the United Kingdom, down to Paraguay, all over the world. Right now, I'm actually sitting in San Diego, right at the border with Mexico, uh, educating and talking about hemp. There's this amazing group of people around the world that um, they're hamsters. It's, I'd like to say that I work for a plant because, um, because once you meet her and you find out what she can do for the environment, you have no choice. You know, in this industry, sometimes the plant pays, sometimes the plant doesn't, but it doesn't matter because we work for a plant because That's she's true. really going to be our tool in order to rebuild what needs to be rebuilt. And along your travels around the world, 
uh, where I met you in, in Germany two years ago. Yes. Ago, yeah. yes. Um, tell us about your experience with the prohibition era. Um, I believe that somehow we shared the same understanding what it means for humanity. Um, but I, I believe it's, it's important yeah. for the audience to understand that there is there are forces that do not allow us to grow us the way that we believe we should. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, not knowing much about uh, about prohibition, I just knew that, you know, cannabis was illegal when I was a kid and going to carrying hemp protein in my store was quite a transition. And it took a good 20 years in the Canadian market for it to really start to be accepted. And even at that point, we still have hemp foods and hemp hearts being only about 5% consumption. Most people still think that it'll get them high. In Paraguay, it's even more so. Everybody who works for the company seems to think there's the, the weed division and they're, you know, giggly and they're laughing and we're just trying to, I mean, we just started feeding them hemp in our staff lunches and stuff like that just to be able to educate them on the benefits that are non-psychoactive. Um, it truly, the, the prohibition was, I mean, in one way, it's actually, I, I, let me put it this way. Let me, let me explain it this way. It's very interesting because this plant has been our oldest agro-grown crop. We've had it for 5,000 years. When we've decided to start as human beings practicing agriculture, hemp was the first thing that we, we planted. Okay. Hemp was our first canvases, our first clothes, our first ropes. Hemp has actually naturally grown alongside us so much so that we have a whole system in our body that only reacts to the phytonutrients that are in hemp, the endocannabinoid system. And so it's natural to think that, you know, as like many creatures in, um, in, the, in the environment have, you know, a, a symbiotic relationship with the plant, that human beings would have this relationship. And, you know, if we, you know, sometimes our relationship can go sour, but we have to make sure that there's a way that these plants always survive. 5,000 years, it's survival of the fittest, even longer than that. Some say this is, this, is a, this is a millennia old plant. We don't know, but it's always been alongside us. And so when prohibition happened, we lost our rope, we lost our canvas, we lost our clothes, we lost our cloth. But then she like has set up this little warning. She set up this little warning beacon, I think, because she had psychoactive properties. So people and humans would actually share and keep the seeds. It's more of a survival mechanism. So no matter what we do, we're never going to get get away from her. It's impossible. Exactly She's right. our tool. She is the thing that we're supposed to build stuff out of. One acre of trees is equal to five, or one acre of hemp is equal to five acres of trees, and it grows in 90 days. You know, I've never seen such a, um, a plant that gets so many entrepreneurs excited. And it's a medicine that truly is changing people, and not to mention a food, which is my favorite part of it, that is perfectly nutritionally balanced for us. It's nature's perfect food for us as humans. So when it comes to prohibition, they can try, but it won't happen. It won't work. She's back and she's here to stay. And I, I just educate people on how to use it as their new tool or their old tool for that matter. And talking about your, your vision or understanding of the uh, prohibition, your work in the education uh, around the world, your projects that you are currently executing in Paraguay and other countries, because you, I know you're involved somehow um, uh, consulting other other companies, especially yeah. in Latin America. Um, uh, what would you what would you tell the investors um, er, er, to participate in, in in all those projects that are happening, not just in your side, but other people like us that are putting their heart and their knowledge, their skills to 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 bring back that plan to all of us. Um, 
it's hard because you know uh, there is a boom going on when it comes like there's so many people who kind of came out into the guns a blazing into the cannabis market in North America and just exploded it and so it's kind of in a bit of a recovery mode at the moment and investors are really weary you know I don't blame them you know this was supposed to be the billion dollar crop it was even touted that in you know 1932 yeah. and so there's a lot of people that are really starting to kind of recover from that aspect of the industry and so investors i i would tell them you know now is the time to start looking into the commodity crops like like um here in paraguay we're working or here in paraguay i forget where i am all the time um <laughs> in um uh, in, in paraguay you know we're talking to them about changing the eucalyptus farms which is um which is how they grow basically toilet paper to hemp and so bigger players are starting to understand that this can have a bigger role especially in the fiber and that industry but you know people are still scared and risky sometimes uh, um, and risk adverse and you know caught in timber are things that they know but I think especially with what with what's going on in the U.S. we're going to see this move that is like the green rush hemp as actually our phone has started ringing I thought when the, when COVID hit I was like oh I don't know if this is going to keep on going. And our phone started ringing because people are looking for green solutions. Um, so I guess to investors, they say like, you know, and um, be really cautious too. make sure that you're not just betting your dreams on something like CBD. Uh, make sure that you're at taking a whole plant approach to the investment, understanding that this is a plant that has valuable fiber, valuable bass fiber, uh, valuable leaf, valuable biomass. If you think it, it can be made out of hemp is something that both Carl and I say as we travel around, you know, this is the opportunity to rethink the wheel with the wheel, the actual wheel we had you know we think it's amazing that you know okay we invented the wheel well we had hemp and we invented everything out of it so um make sure that it's a whole sound approach to the business and that you're you know you're in for the long haul and she will benefit you absolutely I'm, um, i agree with you because um without the participation of the private sector and investments um, um understanding the value in the new times to come, it will be very challenging to to overcome the current times. Yes, yeah. that brings us to the, to our last question, which is more philosophical, which I truly believe, like we both have talked many times, it is um, cannabis or hemp in this particular case. It is my understanding that can help to shape a new era where more green technologies can actually substitute the ones that are destroying the planet. Do you truly believe that we could achieve somehow that self-sustainability, that type of um, circular economy that will benefit all of us if we overcome the loss, of course? Well, the laws are going to have to crumble. It's, there's no point and there's no human being that can take a seat away from another human being. That's unjust and that's wrong. And this is our chance to do to make our own houses to be completely self-sustainable. And it, it has to be, you know, it's just a matter of fighting through. I've been, you know, in talks help, helping with Brazil who it hasn't even um, uh, legalized it as a food. And so it's, it's still very, you know, early on. But what I believe is, you know, naturally we're moving to a place where we're going to go back to living in the earth, not on the earth. And I don't mean that we're going back to caves or wherever, but caves would be comfy. I think they'd be awesome to sleep in. Um, so, but um, we're going back to a place where we live synergistically with our environment, not against her, not against our environment. And, you know, we, we build within our, our means, you know, we, we live within our means, we build within our means, we have enough to live comfortable, beautiful lives, but we don't, all, we don't get everything anymore, because yeah. we don't need it. You know, it's amazing, actually, what you don't need, you know, I've, I've, my life is now, you know, to come down to two bags. And it, I just need what's in two bags. That's all. That's great. You know, um, but my life's a little different um, than most. But so I think that yes, it's going to help us with, you know, becoming more sustainable and moving towards that kind of Gaia Pachamama type of goal of, you know, not living with her because she's so beautiful. 
everywhere I go is just she's breathtaking. And if we live with her and try and not fight her, then we will be happier and healthier human beings. Go hug a tree, you know, plant some hemp, run through the hemp fields. You feel so euphoric. It's just all the terpenes. And remember that our mother gave us this beautiful place that we shouldn't hide from. Agree, agree. And no justice, um, uh, Erin, it is my understanding very humbly that uh, without the plant, it is almost, my understanding will be almost impossible to overcome the current crisis. Uh, uh, cannabis is here to stay. We should not be fighting her anymore. We should embrace her. Um, that will allow us to develop technologies to solve hundreds of problems worldwide. That yeah, is absolutely. Yes. And that's what that's where our institute, ABRI, the Advanced Botanical and Biomass Research Institute, is kind of pioneering the way through technology, um, tech, traditional ecological knowledge, in order to go back down to our roots. I spend a lot of time now with you know different herbal farmers in Paraguay, taking a look at the different indigenous rainforest medicine and how we can possibly you know, tie that in with companion planting. And, you know, and, and of course there's Carl who, you know, spends his time making batteries out of plants. You know, they're, they're, this whole possibility is available for us. And it's just a matter, it's just gonna take more people looking at things a little bit differently and put, taking a different approach to research and a different approach to, to education. You know, um, I, I, I consider myself a teacher, but I'm not one, I'm not a teacher who's in a classroom. I'm a teacher who's on the street. I'm the teacher who's getting all of our marketing department in Paraguay so excited about hemp that they're writing blogs in Portuguese and Spanish. You know, I'm a teacher that goes out and talks to people here about, you talk to me for five minutes and I will try to change the world when it comes to hemp. And so it's, um, it's gonna keep on going and keep on, on building from that. I, I believe that just the fact that we could uh, substitute hemp uh, by uh, using hemp uh, instead of trees to do uh, paper, we should uh, basically uh, stop the deforestation that is happening worldwide. Uh, we should stop. Yeah, trees, trees are for something else. You leave them alone. They're not ours. Exactly. They're not. We're not supposed to do that to that to them. Leave yes. them away, and they they can go for something else. Or you know, even if they need to go for furniture, make it beautiful furniture, but don't turn them into ass wipes. They don't. That's not that. That's not respecting them. Hemp yeah. has that, that versatility to do everything. Exactly. So that is one of the main reasons we're here. We can we can yeah. do furniture. We can do him. We can do housing. We can do everything out of it. Yes, yes. Mm. I don't yeah, know. I, mean, I am very pleased with this uh, short but intense uh, for questions. I don't know if you would like to add something else to the audience. I may find a final message um, that you want to come across. You're more welcome. Um. No. Just. I mean, the world is beautiful, and we have this beautiful plant, and. Um, you know, take the time to look at our beauty and I don't know, you know, we're really lucky now. We're in a new age in a new dawn where we're figuring it out and it's been hard, but it's like mother nature sent us to our rooms and told us to think about it. And now these beautiful, wonderful people are popping out and they're just ready to change the world. So, uh, and that's what hemp gives us an opportunity to do. It's the best tool we possibly have. How has been your challenge? Uh, has he been challenging somehow the weather in Paraguay? Oh, 43 degrees. Yes, it is very, very, very hot. I came, I, as soon as I landed in San Diego and I saw it was 18 degrees, I'm like, oh my God, I might have to wear a jacket. This is going to be exciting. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's really hot. It's very hot there, uh, and this Canadian has been melting. So, yes, yeah, but I can't complain. You know, I've got to, you know, it's, it was like minus 30 in Canada. So, we're not, you think it went down to minus 40 or something like that. But I've decided I only want snow on from December 24th to December 26th. That's it. Then I'll just go to a warm place. Well, my friends all around the world, it has been a great pleasure having Erin Erin on board. Um, Her lovely words, her guidance, her healing vibe that uh, everyone that get to know her or be close to her feel her intensively because that's who she is. She's here for, for a change and that change has put us together. And a lot of people are 
sharing the same values same principle um somehow we're gonna make it happen thank you all thank you Erin. yes and thank you thank you thank you my take friend. care thank you.